Cool. Well, welcome everyone. We're going to get started. This is obviously the IAP class on the replication crisis. I'm David Ramsey. Uh, I'm going to be helping co-teach along with Matt Groh and Noah Jones over here. So uh, you'll be hearing from all of us over the next few weeks. Um, I'm really psyched that all of you are here. Uh, I think, in my opinion, the stakes when it comes to social psychology couldn't be higher, right? Um, whether we want to figure out how to create meaning in our lives or think about meaning in people's lives, whether we're thinking about solving mental health problems, building good habits or breaking bad habits, you know, misinformation, our public discourse, you know, our, the stability of our society, right? There couldn't be more at stake when it comes to understanding individual psychology and the way the environment shapes that. And I think we've really been getting it wrong empirically for the last 20 or 30 years. So uh, this is the place, places like the Media Lab where we do cross-disciplinary research where I think we can revise the strategies we're taking on this stuff, right? We can bring rigorous statistics into play. We can measure things about people in their environments. We can design interventions and we can really push computational social science and empirical techniques in psychology forward in a way that just hasn't been done um, up until now. So. This is the place. Um, so before I talk at all about sort of like the logistics of the class and stuff, I just want to start um, by telling you a story. Um, so imagine that it's 2011 and you're the editor of a really well-respected social psychology journal, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, and you have a big problem, okay? You have received a paper from this man He's a really well-respected professor named Daryl Bem from Cornell. He's, he's published lots of really well-respected theories about psychology uh, before, and this is his magnum opus. This is two years of his work. Uh, it's rigorous. It follows all the statistical techniques that you're used to seeing in all of your papers. It looks just like any other paper you would publish, but you really do not want to publish the paper that this man <laughs> sent you. And the reason, is because this paper proves that we're capable of seeing the future, right? He calls it retrocausality or psi. Uh, and it, it includes several different experiments that prove that we all have premonitions. The most famous one is one where undergraduates are looking, get to look at two separate curtains. They click a curtain and randomly after they click a curtain, one of the curtains will have pornography behind it or one of them will have not. And because we all want to see the pornography, it turns out that people actually click the one, they have a premonition and they click the one with the pornography behind it 53% of the time. And if they're stim stimulus seeking people, they actually click the one with pornography behind it 57% of the time. So these are the kinds of experiments that were in this paper, many of these experiments. So what do you do if you're the editor? What do you do with this paper? Well, the journal editors that had this decision to make, they published it. And alongside it, they wrote this little editorial. And they said, we openly admit that the reported findings conflict with our own beliefs about causality and that we find them to be extremely puzzling. And the next day, the New York Times on the front page published this story. And they said, one of psychology's most respected journals agreed to publish a paper presenting what the author describes as strong evidence for extrasensory perception, the ability to sense future events. The decision is already mortifying scientists generating a mixture of amusement and scorn. This story is viewed as the sort of initiation of the replication crisis in social psychology. It, caused the, the field to be seen as kind of a laughing stock when this was published. But what these editors did was made a really great decision for the field because it exposed the fact that the, the empirical statistical techniques that had become common practice were not working properly. They were not working properly. The next year, Daniel Kahneman, who's a, an incredibly famous uh, Nobel winning psychologist, um, had seen a failed replication attempt of social priming research, which is this idea that you know, subtle, subtle influences in the environment really manifest in their behavior. One of the canonical examples was 
um, doing crossword puzzles where you see words like elderly makes you walk slower, right? Which has been sort of debunked since. Um, and Kahneman wrote an open letter to the field where he basically said, I see a train wreck looming in the field of social priming and social psychology. And Kahneman was absolutely right <laughs> about that. So this table represents a major effort to, to replicate lots of findings in social psychology. So this, is, this was done by 270 different psychologists, all collaborating together on over 100 different social psychology findings. Um, and this, they replicated many times with the instruction of the original authors, all of these different findings in several major psychology journals. And what they found was that on average, 36% of the original findings replicated. And I just wanna like pause and let that sink in with an appro appropriately apocryphal GIF, 36% replicated, right? That's less than 50-50. If, if you see one of these papers and it's 36%, you should actually revise your prior down, right? Um, that's, that's horrifying. And this is another example of a paper that appeared in uh, Nature that did a very similar thing, 21 high power replications of only the articles that appeared in Science and Nature, the two highest impact journals that we can imagine, right? And they did these, these replications with five times on average, the, the sample sizes of the original studies. And they found a little bit better result that 62% of the, the studies replicated. Um, the fascinating thing about this plot is that at the same time, they also did prediction markets on each of these studies, right? So they asked people to predict whether they thought the studies would replicate. And so what you see here is the yellow ones did not replicate, the blue ones did replicate, and this x-axis is how people guessed whether they would replicate or not. And it turns out people guessed really, really well <laughs> which ones would replicate and which ones wouldn't. So even though the replication rate is really poor, there, there is one of two things that you can take away from this plot. Either people are really good at intuiting what things drive human behavior and you should trust your intuition, or people, you know, these people had access to the papers. They were able to check the papers and decide for themselves whether the methodologies are good. So even though things don't replicate, right? A lot of things don't replicate and you should be very, very skeptical when you're going through this literature. Um, there's hope, right? If you understand the types of mistakes people make and you have good intuition and you bring it to bear, you know, it's possible to sort of dissect these things pretty reliably. I just wanna mention that this is not just something that occurs in the field of social psychology. So this is a very famous paper from 2005 about the medical literature from Ioannidis from Stanford. And it's sort of well known and well, um, established at this point when it comes to uh, drug research and preclinical cancer research, that when they move to the clinical trials, about half of them fail. So this causes tens of billions of dollars. It's the same sort of systemic problem as we're talking about in social psychology. There's similar problems in machine learning. This is a paper written by a guy that I, in a group I worked with at Google a few years ago that I think is really fascinating, where he looked at a particular type of neural network, the GAN, and he, took all of the improvements that people had made on the GAN in the next four years, and he tested all of them over all hyperparameters, over all data sets, and showed that none of them had actually improved the original GAN. And you can see uh, in the paper, he says, we need a more systematic and objective evaluation procedure. So similar, similar sorts of problems affect machine learning. Um, and then the other one that's very common right now is neuroscience and fMRI research. A lot of these studies are underpowered. And some of the analyses have showed that um, there's a lot of variability in how people do their data analysis. So they get, in this study, they gave people the same data, 70 different teams from great universities around the world, the same data, and all of them came up with different results on the different hypotheses. So this kind of problem is actually endemic to lots of different disciplines. Um, and it's not just social science, even though we're gonna be focusing on social science in the class. Um, so welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the class. Um, I hope I have convinced you that this is a real problem. It's an important problem. Um, and uh, I just want to 
talk a little bit now about why we're doing this class and what you can expect from the class. So for me, a lot of the motivation here is, you know, I'm in the responsive environments group here at the Media Lab. Um, when I came in, I was really bought into pop psychology hard. You know, I really believed that subtle changes in your environment sort of puppeteer your behavior in ways that you do not understand and that we could nudge you and sort of control you um, and really powerfully manipulate you based off of modifying the environment. And it's only over a few years of sort of digging into the research, looking critically at some of these things that I came to realize that a lot of the things I believed in were just wrong and, and incredibly overstated. Um, and I've also noticed when I meet people that have sort of come to this conclusion themselves, we typically don't cite the same primary sources. It's a blog here or a researcher there that we really like. And there, hasn't, there isn't really a centralized source of information or how to deal with this problem in social psychology, how to pour the social psychology into our work and use it practically, right? So um, that's a big part of the goal in my mind for this course is just centralizing some of these ideas, um, focusing on solutions. So if you wanna be a practitioner, how can we sort of build back up instead of just show what's wrong? Um, and the other thing I would say is I think very few people folk covered the full extent of the crisis. And I'll talk about this a little bit in a minute, but a lot of people focus just on the statistical problems that led to this crisis. And I think there's, there are levels that are much deeper that Matt and I are gonna be talking about in future, future lectures. <laughs> so uh, the, the structure of the class is just gonna be five, five lectures, basically. We have two hour blocks. The goal is gonna be to um, have the lecture be an hour and a half or so, an hour to an hour and a half, and leave time for us to talk. Um, I'd like for it to be a very sort of flat class structure. I mean, we're all, we all bring something different to the table. We're all sort of figuring this replication crisis stuff out together. And I'm constantly learning myself of new papers, new techniques. And so I'm hoping that this can serve as a place just for people that are interested in this kind of work to chat, get to know each other, share resources. And um, we'll, we'll try to keep some time just to keep that aspect of the class uh, at the end. In terms of what we're gonna cover today, I'm gonna try to cover just like a big picture what's going on with the crisis, why did it happen, you know, like a self-contained introduction to the crisis and how to think about it. And we'll get into more details as we go along. Um, the next class, Noah is going to be talking to us about practical skills for navigating the crisis, um, some meta statistical techniques for analyzing groups of uh, literature, and then we're going to get more into this sort of philosophical underpinnings that um, cause the crisis. I think there's some really interesting meaty stuff to talk about there. And then we're gonna finish up with um, practical stories of what has failed to replicate, things you should avoid, you know, how to think about some of these things. If you're taking the class for credit, um, we will, there will be one assignment and that will, will sort of explain it next class, um, which will basically be to take a topic that you're interested in, read several papers and pull out the main statistic from them and do a very basic metastatistical analysis on that topic. And time permitting, um, we will have people talk about their metastatistical analysis on the last day of class. Um, so I think we have about 13 people registered for credit right now. I don't know how many people will continue to the end, um, but so to, to be determined exactly on how we structure that. Um, the other two things I want to note, one, just to say up front, right, like a lot of the people that you might think of as perpetrators <laughs> of the replication crisis are really victims of it, right? Like they have learned, they've been taught bad statistical techniques, they apply them, they build careers over 20 or 30 years, and now everything that they've done is being called into question, their careers are likely falling apart, right? And uh, there's a little bit of schadenfreude kind of like delight and hypocrisy that I think is a natural instinct. I just want to sort of say up front that try not to give into that. If you see me sit, you know, sort of be like, oh my God, can you believe this? And not, and not be charitable to the people that we're sort of like talking about. I think it's just very important to be cognizant of the tone when, when you're dealing with, you know, people's livelihoods and careers. And many times it's not their fault that they've been promoting what is empirically poor research, right? Um, the other thing I'll say too is for me, uh, 
you know, there, there are very advanced, great statistical minds right now who are arguing about what we would normally think of as very simple statistical concepts. And so I would encourage you to go back to basics with your statistics and really dig in with some of these things, but just to sort of remain humble because it's amazing how even very simple statistics can be you know, very complex if you start to wrestle with them at a high level. And part of what we're gonna do today is try to talk about conceptually how we should be thinking about some pretty, what would be normally considered very simple statistical techniques. Any questions? Well, so I sort of alluded to the fact that I feel like people don't always cover all aspects of the replication crisis when they talk about the replication crisis. And um, they're expert. This is how I think of it. So there are experts at each level here. Um, but the sort of fundamental level, which doesn't usually get talked about with the replication crisis, which we're going to cover, is something I would call ontologies. So what are the things that we're talking about? What are the quantities we're talking about? And how do they relate to each other, right? What does it mean to measure the meaning in someone's life? What does it mean to measure attention? How does behavior and personality, how do those things interact? What can you even say about an individual, right? Like, do they have traits, moods, dispositions? How does that interact with environments? How do you describe environments and really capture all the variability of environments? You know, what are the fundamental units that we're using when we're talking about social science and how do those things interact and mediate and moderate? How do we, how do we reason about these relationships? So we, I, I actually think we've made some very big problematic assumptions at this level that we'll be describing later in the class. And a lot of the really interesting problems and a lot of the in interesting work moving forward actually exists at this sort of ontological level, which is below what is typically discussed when we talk about the replication crisis. The next level up is this sort of systemic level, which does get talked about a bit, but is less talked about, I would say. And this is just the sort of, if, you have, if you've heard of Kuhn, the sort of like philosophy of science uh, level of how we're doing research, right? How much of it is about real empiricism versus individuals who are incentivized to tell a story, right? And what are we rewarding in the academic sort of scholarship level? And so there are things like hype, fraud, you know, the types of things that you would expect when they're pro systematic incentive problems, right? Um, so that's sort of a level above once we've agreed on the fundamental things we're measuring. And then obviously part of the system is the methods we're using, the statistical methods we're using. And a lot of people do misapply the statistical methods. And so this is what we're going to really talk about today, probably one and two a little bit, but mostly one. Um, and this is really what most people focus on when they talk about the replication crisis. But like I said, we're going to try to cover all three. All right. So to, to kick things off and to kind of have this conversation at all, like how did we end up in this state where so few findings replicate, right? We really need to go back to basics with conceptual stats. Um, and I'm going to try to review this in a way that is accessible to people, even if they haven't really had statistical training. But I'm going to move quickly and just kind of re review the basic sort of hypothesis testing and what goes wrong. So I hope, I hope it's a review for you. If it's new and it feels like it's going too fast, you know, I'm happy to sit down with you and talk through it in more detail. But we're just going to kind of quickly review some concepts uh, about how to think about hypothesis testing. And I really like this quote by Gerd Gigerenzer, um, where, where he was looking at, he, was, he surveyed a bunch of professors, researchers, you know, uh, teachers of stat, statist, uh, statistics teachers and sort of showed that basically all researchers have some very fundamental misunderstanding of, of core statistics and that we should be teaching statistical thinking, not statistical rituals. And I really like that way of thinking about it. It's about the way you're thinking when you approach these problems. And if you're applying a ritual blindly, you are definitely not doing it right. <laughs> Um, so to start out with, um, I'm going to talk about uh, comparing two groups as you would in sort of like a uh, two sample t-test, right? So let's just say that we are, we have a miracle drug that's going to help you with your depression, and we have a control group in yellow, we have an intervention group that's getting the drug in, in green, 
and we're monitoring their self-reported happiness. So in this case, we can assume that there are thousands of people in this study, thousands and thousands. So these distributions are very accurate. And so what we would expect here is that our p-value is low. It's statistically significant because we, because we have a lot of confidence in the study. We have a large number of participants. And then we can look and see that our, our effect size, the difference between the means of this group, is about one on a scale of zero to 10, right? So one out of 11. So we can be very confident. We have a very low p-value, but the effect is very small and maybe not very important in the grand picture, right? We can contrast that with something like this. Let's say we have a much smaller n, right? So we can't be quite as certain that these distributions actually are the distributions, right? That, that we would expect if we kept sampling and we had a much larger n, right? So our p-value maybe isn't significant in this case, but it's very suggestive, this, this very, very large effect size is suggestive that maybe this is a miracle drug, right? So the point that I wanna make is that effect sizes are, are very, very important. And the thing that you really should be focusing on, p-values are important too, but so much when it comes to how statistics are taught, people say, focus on the p-value and p-value tends to be the thing that people take away. Effect size is more important, I would say. Effect size is extremely important. So when you're trying to understand um, you know, how an intervention, whether an intervention actually matters, the number one thing that you should really be concerned about is the effect size. You know, how much is it actually increasing happiness? And let's take a look at this example too, right? So same thing, let's just say both of these are really high N, so we can have really high confidence in both of these. They're both statistically significant, right? And moreover, both of them have the same absolute effect size, right? So they're both moving these populations one, one on a scale of one to 10 of self-reported happiness. In this case, right, we're moving two standard deviations, basically. We're moving everybody from a three to a four. And in this case, we're moving people, you know, point to standard deviations. We're moving people from a zero to a nine up a little bit to a one, one to a 10. Those are different. We should probably conceive of those as, as different, right? And the point that I want you to take away from this plot is that we care both about the absolute effect size, you know, that this is one on a scale of one to 10, and the normalized effect size, that we've moved people to standard deviations versus 0.2 standard deviations. Both of those are useful pieces of information for us to reason about, you know, what's happening here. So to summarize, I have quoted a couple of the best statisticians of the last, you know, 100 years. Statistical significance is the least interesting thing about results. You should describe the results in terms of measures of magnitude. The primary product of a research inquiry is one or more measures of effect size, not p-values. When you're reading papers and you're reasoning about these things, you should be focused on effect sizes. So this is the summary aside to summarize a basic um, t-test from, from your statistics courses. Hopefully you remember it, but I wanna walk through it really fast. So once again, we're, we're talking about the same kind of example. We have a control and we have an intervention group and we sample these groups. And the first thing we're gonna do is calculate an effect size, a normalized effect size. So we're looking at the difference in means between these groups divided by the pooled standard deviation, right? And when you're looking in the literature, you'll see this called Cohen's D or you'll see it called Hodge's G. And Hodge's G just has a different way of computing this pooled standard deviation that's better for smaller sample sizes. So the first thing that we always do is calculate a um, normalized effect size. The next thing we do is we calculate our test statistic. So that's T here, right? And T is simply our normalized effect size divided by some measure of sampling error, right? So this, these ends are how many samples we're drawing in our, in our two groups, right? So all test statistics are this ratio between a normalized effect size and some measure of sampling error. So this T value is one number that gives us basically an idea of how confident we should be in our result, right? It gets bigger when we have a bigger spread um, a larger number of standard deviations of difference, 
And it also gets bigger as we increase our n and we sample more, right? So one useful number. And if you look at your statistics textbook, what you'll typically see is a distribution of this t value that represents what you would expect if there was no difference between the control group and the intervention group, right? So if, if in reality, we're just drawing from this one uh, control group distribution and there's no difference between our two, right? If we, we can pull a few samples and then a few samples, and we're gonna expect some difference of mean between those, those samples just because of randomness, right? So we're gonna get some effect size and some T value, but on average, we expect that value to um, be centered around zero. So we can plot the T values we would accept, expect just from randomness, basically, um, if we were drawing from one underlying distribution. And this is how, this is where we get our p-value, right? This is where we say whether our test is significant or not, right? So our p-value represents where, how, where on this curve we're falling, um, how likely it is that the data that we're seeing was drawn is the result of random drawing from an underlying, the, the sort of null distribution, right? Like the, the un, one underlying distribution for both our control group and our intervention group, right? And typically what has happened, you know, what you're used to seeing, right? Is if that p-value is, is uh, less than 0.05, then we would accept it as statistically significant, right? And that p, that 05 number is known as the alpha. Right? So the p-value once again is um, where we fall on this curve, how likely it is, how much area there is under this distribution, how likely it is that the data that we're seeing is due to random sampling from one underlying distribution, basically. It's noise from one underlying distribution. And I, this I've taken from this guy, Chris Tufts website. This is, um, basically uh, how we would think about power analysis. So another thing that you can do and you should do, right? We can plot the T values we would expect to get if there's no effect. And we can plot against, we can plot over top of that, the T values we would expect to get with an effect size that we choose, right? So let's assume that we're gonna get a certain effect size, say like 1.1 standard deviation. We can plot the distribution of T values that we would expect for that effect size, if we assume that effect size would be true. And using that, we can make estimates about how likely we are to see a real result or to accept a real result um, if we set our alpha value at some level. And that's considered the power. So the power gives you some indication, right, of how likely you are to correctly reject the null hypothesis and accept an alternative hypothesis um, if there is a real effect of the size that you have assumed, right? I know that's, I know this is a lot, but the basic thing that I want you to take away, right, is as we increase our sampling rate, we increase our power. And the more power there is, the more likely we are to, to accurately, to, to capture that there's a real effect when in fact there is a real effect. And if it, there's too little power, we're very likely to not see statistical significance when there is a real underlying effect, right? So to summarize everything that we just go over, we just went over, right? We care about the effect size. You should care very much about the effect size. Always look at the effect size. And we care about the normalized effect size, which is the main thing that you see reported frequently um, in the psychology literature. Our test statistic is the normalized effect size over some sampling error. And then we have a few different ways of thinking about alpha, our 0.05 value, beta, which is the inverse of, of power. So alpha um, is the likelihood of a false positive if we never test a true claim, right? If we never test a true claim, how likely are we to see a p-value of, of greater than or equal to alpha? And power is how likely are we to detect an effect if there is an effect, right, of the size that we have expected. So what's wrong with this picture? What is wrong with how we're, we're approaching this? Like, how is it when we do this hypothesis testing, we ended up with all of these failures of replications and, you know, such a dire um, state of affairs in the research literature? Well, 
I would say that the problem here is alpha, right? And it's really the, a misinterpretation of alpha. It's a, it's a thinking of alpha categorically, that if something is less than alpha, it's true. And if it's more than alpha, it's false, right? If we have a p-value less than 0.05, it must be true. And if it's, if it's uh, more than that, it's false. And I wanna just really dig into that because it's such an important point and it's something that a lot of people get wrong. And in fact, the surveys have sort of shown that 86% of statistics teachers and 40% of psychology professors fundamentally misunderstand how to interpret a p-value, right? So this is a simple concept, but uh, it's very, very important. And a lot of people get it very, very wrong. And so to, to illustrate it, I want you to think about two professors, Professor Alice and Professor Bob, right? And Professor Alice is testing very unlikely hypotheses. She's searching for a needle in the haystack. She's looking for that big life-changing paradigm shifting invention, right? Or, or result. And so because of that, one out of a thousands of the things that she's testing are gonna be real, right? She's really searching for something very, very far out there. And then we have Professor Bob. And Professor Bob is simply quantifying effect sizes of common sense things that we all know to be true, right? Professor Bob is saying, you know, sugar causes cavities, right? We know that, so I'm just gonna see how much it causes cavities, and I wanna quantify that. So Professor Bob, in Professor Bob's case, four out of five of the things that he's testing are real. They're real effects. They have different strategies as professors. And for this example, we're gonna say, let's look at one experiment. You know, they're both going to do one experiment at 90% power. So in this one experiment, what are the odds of a p-value less than 0.05 just from noise, from chance, right? It's not a trick question. <laughs> the answer is five, there's a 5% likelihood, 0.05, right? That is sort of the definition of, the, of um, what a p-value means, right? There's a 5% chance just from randomness that we would get a p-value less than 0.05. The odd, and then what are the odds of a real effect um, leading to a p-value of 0.05 for each of these professors? Well, the odds of that are gonna be related to the likelihood that they have a real um, effect that they're seeing, which is the prior, right? So if, if Professor Alice is running these tests, only one out of a thousand have a real effect. And then, we, and then we multiply that by the power. How likely is Professor Alice to detect a real effect um, given that there is a, a real effect to detect, right? So Professor Alice, because she's very rarely testing hypotheses that are real, right? When she see, she's gonna get a lot of chance, P value is less than 0.05, and only very seldomly is she gonna get one due to a real effect. Professor Bob, on the other hand, because almost everything he's testing is real, he's gonna get a lot of p-values that are because of real effects. And also a similar number from chance, just like a small number from chance. So if we look at them, what is the likelihood of a p-value less than 0.05 being a real effect for each of them? It's pretty simple to calculate and the numbers are pretty dramatic, right? So for Professor Alice, 1.8% of the p-value, we would expect 1.8% of the p-values that she sees that are less than 0.05 to be evidence of a real effect, that she found something real, right? Whereas for Professor Bob, the answer is 98%. 98% of the time, right, Professor Bob is going to, uh, a p-value of less than 0.05 means that there's a real effect. So um, if you are feeling like an instinct that I just made a value judgment or that I've said that Professor Bob is a better researcher or we should, you know, that there's something here where I have preferentially said something about Professor Bob, that means that you've internalized the incorrect interpretation of p-values. I have this feeling, right? It's like, oh, if I look at these two researchers at, with a p-value of less than 0.05, Bob is the good one, right? But that's not at all what I'm saying, right? Both of these folks are running their experiments at 90% power, right? They're both good researchers. And honestly, I'd rather be Professor Alice. I don't wanna be quantifying things that everyone knows, right? Like I, I would much prefer to be trying to find things that are sort of unique and interesting and un undiscovered. The thing that I'm saying is that you can't use the same p-value 
for both of these people, right? The way you think about the p-value has to change. And if you care about understanding whether an effect is real based off of the p-value, you have to do this mental calculation every time you come in contact with a p-value. It depends on the prior. It depends on how likely the thing that is being tested is to exist, right? And that quantity has a name. It's called the positive predictive value, right? So this is the thing that people very frequently confuse p-values for. And you can see it's the calculation that we just did, right? How, how likely something is to be true given a certain p-value has to do with the alpha that you've selected, uh, the power of the study that you're using, and then your prior odds, your prior odds, right? And you can see here a nice plot that appears in um, a, a paper on power analysis, where for studies of different power and different prior odds, you can see how likely an effect is to be real, right? So you should not trust underpowered studies. You should not trust underpowered studies and you, should, you have to scale your uh, interpretation of how likely something is to be real with a given p-value based off of your prior. So to quote Fisher, the father of modern statistics, no scientific worker has a fixed level of significance at which from year to year, in all circumstances, he rejects hypotheses. He rather gives his mind to each particular case in the light of his evidence and his ideas. So you should never use a fixed level of when you're thinking about p-values, right? And you should not confuse these, these two quantities. So just to drive this home one more time, does a p-value of less than 0.05 mean an effect is 95% likely to be real? What is, what is the likelihood of a, an effect being real? That's the positive predictive value, right? That's a, this is a common error that people make. Does a p-value less than 0.05 mean the same experiment will find a significant result 95% of the time? No, right? What is that? This is study power. Does a hypothesis tell you anything certain about the hypothesis being true or false? No, right? It depends on your priors and you need to be thinking probabilistically about these things, right? Categorical thinking is not the right way to approach hypothesis testing. So I'm not the only one that is up on a you know, soapbox about this topic. And if you look in the literature over the last like three or four years, you'll see that the American Statistical Association has been issuing many commentaries exactly on this topic against the idea of statistical significance, that P less than 0.05 matters or doesn't, and that the way we talk about statistics is wrong. And this summarizes, um, this appeared in Nature, this summarizes some of it, right? So it shows the American st uh, statistician came out saying, don't use statistically significant. Another article, a dozen of signatories also calls on authors and journal ed editors to disavow these terms. We agree and call for the entire concept of statistical significance to be abandoned. And if they did an analysis of, you know, 800 articles across five different journals and showed that over 50% are fundamentally misunderstanding this extremely basic concept. So the takeaway from this what I've just described is don't say statistically significant in your papers. Don't say statistically, statistically significant. Report full p-values. Don't ever report p less than 0.05. And if you see a paper where someone does report p less than 0.05, you probably shouldn't, you should, your ears should perk up because they misunderstand the statistics fundamentally. Um, and then the other thing is obviously interpret p-values cautiously based off of your priors, right? So if you're playing along, the next question you might have is, what does that mean for the idea of replication, right? Doesn't this destroy the idea of replication? Because what, how do we think of replication, right? Is someone did a test, it was statistically significant. We repeat the same test, is it still statistically significant, right? So the idea of replication is really a categorical idea. And you're absolutely right. Right, the idea of replication is a really terrible idea that perpetuates the same problems that got us here in the first place. Right, it, and the way to think about 
the word replication uh, is really as like a heuristic to communicate efficiently, not as the, the concept that you might want to ascribe to it, right? So when you see the term replication, there's really two ways that I've seen it used. One is the estimated replication rate, right? Which is if you run the exact same study with the exact same number of participants again, would how many times would you expect it to replicate versus give you a statistically significant result or not? And then there's sort of the colloquial use of the term, which is we're going to run the same study, but at a much higher power. And we're going to say something about whether the first study was right in terms of the effect size and, you know, sort of loosely interpreted, did, it, did that paper, was that paper honest, you know? Um, but you should be very careful about the term replication because categorical thinking is a cardinal sin <laughs> in statistics. Um, okay, so we've talked a little bit about this sort of real big problem of thinking categorically. Now I wanna talk about how that translates to what we see in the literature, right? So how does it happen when we apply statistical, what happens when we apply the, this concept, this sort of categorical concept of things that hit our p-value of 0.05 are true? You know, what happens when we apply that to the literature, right? And I love this XKCD. You should keep this front of mind when you're thinking about the replication crisis. So as you can see, right, the scientists are testing every color of jelly bean to see whether jelly beans cause acne. And they test every 20 different types of colors. And guess what? Because of random chance, one of them achieves a p-value of 0.05 because we've done 20 tests. And the headline is now green jelly beans linked to acne. This perfectly captures the state of affairs in academia right now when it comes to social psychology, right? We are, have access to a newspaper or, or paper that makes a claim like this. And we need to reason back about the process that led to that claim, right? There's not a problem. If we knew, right, that these people were testing every single color of jelly bean, it wouldn't be a problem. Right? We would expect that AP value would, be, would arrive that was less than 0.05, and we would revise the way we think about that P value, right? because we know they did 20 tests, and we would expect one just from random chance to be less than 0.05. But when we throw all of this away, and we're just left with the result that we're looking at, we have no idea how many tests they, you know, they were running. It's a lot harder to reason about what's going on. Right? So this is a really great analogy um, that really sums up a lot of things. So how do we get there? Well, systemically, one of the first things we can talk about is publication bias. So this is right. This is where all 20 papers got submitted to the to the, a journal. Right? They submitted blue jelly beans cause acne, red jelly beans cause acne. But the only one that the the journal wants to publish is the one that sounds catchy and interesting. Right? So they only publish green jelly beans cause acne, and not blue jelly beans don't, yellow jelly beans don't you know, teal jelly beans don't, right? So that's publication bias. That's one way we get into the situation. A similar problem is the fire drawer effect, right? Which is when researchers internalize the fact that publications are not going to print their non-significant results. So instead of even submitting them, they do tests and they put them in their file drawer and they don't submit them, right? So this is a big problem. We don't know who's testing what. And instead of having, you know, access to all of that information, we only get the result that achieves statistical significance, right? Luckily, there are tools that we can use to detect this kind of problem. And uh, Noah's gonna be covering a lot of this in his talk uh, next time, but just briefly, this is one that I really like. This is called a funnel plot. And the idea here, right, is that um, the larger N you have, the more confidence you can have in your measurement, the less variability you would expect uh, in your effect size. So the better your test, the less variability close to the true effect size you would expect. And as you get um, less smaller sample sizes, you expect more variability that spreads out. And you would expect this to create a triangle, right? You're getting closer to the true average. So um, when you see this sort of skew, it indicates that we have problems of publication bias. And there are a bunch of techniques that we can use to, to analyze and tell whether this type of thing is going on. 
I'll also point out that one of my favorite guys in this topic area, Ulrich Schimmick, has a blog where he analyzes journals and runs metastatistical techniques on them and publishes the results. So you can go there and you can actually look and see, you know, get a little bit of a sense for um, what, whether a journal is behaving in a way that is appropriate or not. This should always be taken with a grain of salt. All of these sort of metastatistical analysis have a lot of potential flaws with them and can be very noisy, but it is something that is useful to think about. File drawer effects are particularly dangerous when it comes to really in vogue research, right? So if every single researcher in the world is testing some topic of interest, most of them are not gonna get significant results and put it in a file drawer. Some of them are gonna hit crazy effect sizes just because of randomness, right? So this is a particular, you should be particularly aware of this if there's a really in vogue hot research topic. You know, it's more likely that people by random chance will get really big effect sizes just because so many people are trying those topics. So beware of in vogue research topics. And then for you as a researcher, you should publish all of your findings all the time if you can, right? And that includes uh, open access if you can't, you know, get a, a peer reviewed journal to publish them. So a corollary of this problem is what's called the winner's curse. And once again, right, we have a bunch of people sort of rolling the die, trying to get that p-value that's less than 0.05. And what happens is if you have really underpowered studies, right, the only way to get that t value, that test statistic up is to get a really big effect size. So when you're rolling the die like this, if you have a lot of underpowered studies, you would expect the effect sizes to be reported to be grossly inflated, because that's the only way that you can hit the p-value that gets you into a journal, right? And there's a lot of good analysis of this, but basically, you know, what happens is generally across the board, right, you can expect the real effect sizes to be a half to one one hundredth of what gets uh, reported. And that's like a really rough heuristic, but it's just something to keep in mind that there is a lot of inflation uh, in the literature in terms of the real effect sizes. Um, and it's good to just kind of, you know, if you're going to try to build an intervention based off of some social psychology study, beware and revise your estimates down. So I just touched on ways that we sort of systematically get to this problem where we're left with this newspaper and we have no access to this stuff. Next, I want to talk about um, how this happens as an individual researcher, right? So as an individual researcher, you can do the same thing. You can test 20 hypotheses and report one, right? And you're, you're creating the, the same type of problem as the systemic issues of publication bias and file drawer effects. So I lovingly entitled this, How Not to Be a Bad Researcher. <laughs> so all of these are just variations on this theme, basically, of running a bunch of hypothesis tests and um, only reporting the ones that hit. But that comes in a lot of different styles, right? And we typically call these things questionable research practices or research degrees of freedom um, and a bunch of other different names. But I just want to point out a few examples of how you might accidentally do this, right? So one example is optimal stopping, right? So you run a test on 10 people, you check to see if it was significant. You add another five people, you check to see if it was significant. You run another five people, you check. And if you keep checking that, all of a sudden, we've tested our hypothesis 20 times, right? We've done multiple hypothesis testing. So if you see a paper that has some weird N that doesn't seem like they picked it ahead of time, perhaps you know this could be a reason why, and your ears should perk up a little bit when you see that. Another thing that I've seen in many papers that I think are interesting in psychology is all people combine weird subgroups of tests and experiments together and run the analysis on those groups, on the individual subsets. You know, they run all these interesting combinations of analysis, right? And once again, you know, it's very easy to test lots and lots of hypotheses um, very quickly and only report the one that, that hits, right? So beware if, if a paper reports some very unusual combination of experimental results that they, that they tested. And they don't report that they tested individual things or things that make sense. You know, your ears should perk up that perhaps they tried a bunch of combinations of things and they only published the one that hit, right? Um, and again, testing many hypotheses and only reporting the successes, very similar, similar problem. This one I'll say 
like our green jelly bean example, right? If you read a paper and there's some weird mediating variable, like why are green jelly beans causing acne? Why isn't it just jelly beans causing acne, right? That doesn't make any sense. Perhaps they tested all the colors of jelly beans and they just reported the one that, was, that happened to hit, right? So if you see weird mediating variables or weird, very specific, you know, conditions, that's a sign for you to be a little bit worry about the report, the, the results that are being reported. And then another one is uh, people that have a narrative agenda, motivated research, right? So if you see someone that every study they ever publish all supports one idea and it all, you know, every single test is spotless and there's never any question, you know, there's never any results that don't hit significance, Maybe they're testing something obvious. I mean, maybe they've hit on something really good. You have to use your prior and your intuition here, but this is also, you know, something to be very uh, cognizant of. And just as an example, Daryl Bem, our, our guy from the very first story, you know, he has sort of in interviews said exactly this type of thing, right? I gather data to show how my point would be made. I use it as a point of persuasion, right? Probably the type of studies that someone that has this approach to research is putting out are not ones that you should be trusting. Okay, so we've talked about testing multiple hypotheses and reporting one, right? And I want to be clear that it's okay to test multiple hypotheses if you report everything that you do, right? The, the, the big thing is that we understand the landscape of what you're doing so we can revise how we're interpreting your results appropriately, right? But so far we've talked about um, reporting hypotheses that you have come up with without seeing the data. And something that you really should not do <laughs> is called harking, right? And that's coming up with a hypothesis, hypothesis after looking at the data that you've collected, right? Hypothesizing after the results are known, right? So if, if someone, is running a study and they think before that study, right? I think there could be like a linear relationship between these two quantities. And then they collect a little bit of data and it shows a linear relationship between those two quantities. That's incredibly powerful evidence that there is probably a linear relationship between those two quantities, right? If on the flip side, you collect a bunch of data and you look at it all and all the different, you know, combinations of things, and you see that a couple of variables have a linear relationship. Well, there's all sorts of patterns that you might expect in the data, right? And if you then act like you predicted that there was a linear relationship when you see the linear relationship or you fit a line to that and you show that it's a really good line, right? That's incredibly misleading, right? The assumption is that you've made a a priori hypothesis and then you test it afterwards, right? So this, is, this can be very difficult to detect and it's very important that you don't do this. One version of this is trying a ton of different variations in your modeling technique, right? And I think so many people, you know, I've been guilty of this. So many people don't realize what they're doing when they're doing this, but right, you, you throw out an outlier and that didn't work. Maybe you, nor you normalize your data slightly differently. That doesn't work. You, whatever, you like impute your data, the missing parts of your data a little bit. That doesn't work. You know, you slightly change so, you know, you, you end up running 50 different variations of some test, one of them happens to hit, right? Like the, this is uh, sort of textbook, something that you should not do, right? Which is not to say, so it's textbook, something you should not do if you report that data as you have come up with the hypothesis a priori, right? But it is okay to collect some data and mine it, mine it, you know, like look for relationships, as long as you're extremely explicit about the fact that what you did was, is an exploratory analysis, right? So there are two ways we think about these, these kinds of studies. We can have exploratory studies and confirmatory studies, right? And the textbook example for this one is John Gottman, who's really famous as a um, researcher on divorce, right? And um, he has good, you know, good ideas. A lot of people, you know, he's very successful. But if you look at his website, the number one most frequently asked question is, can Dr. Gottman really predict whether a couple will get divorced with 94% accuracy, 
And the answer is no, obviously, no one can ever predict human behavior with that kind of accuracy. That's insane, right? I mean, maybe you can predict kids like sweets with that kind of, I don't know, probably not even that, right? No, you can't, right? And where that came from is the fact that John Gottman did an exploratory study and people interpreted it as a confirmatory study, right? So what he did was he had a, a group of, you know, 20 couples. He measured a bunch of things about those couples and he looked to see which one got divorced. And then he went back and he separated the divorced couples from the couples that didn't get divorced. And he said, what are the relationships in this group of couples, this group of 10 couples say that didn't get divorced that is different from the ones that did, right? And it turns out if you have a 10 couples, there's gonna be lots of things that separate 10, any 10 couples from any other 10 couples, right? You can, expl you can get 94% on any two groups of 10 couples, right? And this is what got confused, right? Everyone started reporting, he can predict divorce with 94% accuracy. What he can do is look at those things and reason about them, right? Like, oh, there are relationships in this couple that aren't in this couple, does that make sense? Would that predict divorce? And then he can run a confirmatory study to um, test whether those relationships actually um, are predictive of divorce, right? And he has done some of that work and it's um, obviously nowhere near 94%, but this is sort of a textbook example of exploratory versus confir confirmatory studies. These are two separate techniques that you should use um, when you're thinking about these things. So this is another example um, of uh, sort of a p hacking, a very textbook p hacking example. This is Brian Wansink from Cornell. Basically, every research study that you've heard of on food, you know, this guy wrote, and he ended up having to resign because of academic misconduct. Um, and he has blog posts where he talks, you know, he talks about p hacking shouldn't be confused with deep data dives, and he basically goes through and describes p hacking his data and doing exactly what we're talking about coming up with hypotheses after the fact applying them and um and then reporting them as if they were a priori hypotheses so there are a few tools that we can use um, to do researcher specific analysis um, once again ulrich Schimmick has a, a personalized p-value web page where he ranks the top 400 psychologists again interpret this with an incredible amount of caution. It's very noisy, um, but you can go through and see uh, some meta statistics about all of these different researchers based off of a really rough analysis. And one of the things you'll notice if you look at it is that he will automatically reduce the alpha level of significance for many of the researchers. And that's a good heuristic to have, I think in general, right? So you know, if everyone's p-hacking at a level of 0.05 and we reduce the level of results we accept as being meaningful to 0.01, we're going to throw out a lot of the bad results, right? Um, so that's just like a heuristic that, that might be useful. And there's also a ton of meta-statistical tools to look at bias and to detect all of the types of things that we've been talking about in groups of literature, which once again, I'm not really going to go over them, but uh, Noah will cover some of these things at the next level. Um, so a couple of other things that I think are really important just to go over when it comes to how not to be a bad researcher. We've talked a little bit about power analysis and the problems that are associated with low power studies, right? And so it's always important when you're doing research to perform an a priori power analysis, right? So you, you should guess how big of an effect size you might um, expect, and then see how large of a sample size you would need in order to detect that, that um, effect. And this is just to preserve your time, right? If you're running studies where your study is severely underpowered, you're not gonna be able to detect real effects when the real effects are there, right? And other people are not gonna trust your work if you're running underpowered studies all the time. So you should always um, do an a priori power analysis. And these are a few links, I'll be sending this out, but these are a few links that sort of talk about how to do that and a couple of tools that you can use in order to do that when you go to do your own research. And a corollary of the fact that you should do an a priori power analysis is you should beware researchers who start with an N equals 20, right? Because this is kind of like the standard practice in social psychology over the last several years. 
And this indicates that this researcher probably did not do an a priori power analysis. And I would suggest that you should. So if, if you run into a, a paper where there's an n equals 20, you should say, what is the effect that this person is testing? How big do I think that effect is probably going to be? And then how, how big of a sample size would that person need to detect that effect? And if the sample size they have in the paper is 20, and they need a sample size of 200 or 500, because you, you know, based off of your intuition, you know, perhaps you should not trust the results of that paper, right? The other thing that's really important to know is pre-registration, right? So this is gaining momentum. Here are a few places where you can pre-register your studies. This mitigates so many of the problems, right? Like you, you a priori, you write down what hypotheses you have, the data analysis techniques you use, and more and more of the major universities are signing up to this sort of pre-registration challenge. And papers that are doing this in many journals get a badge that they were pre-registered. And so you, this is a great indicator that you should trust the paper. And this is something that you, know, you should do for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fair point. <laughs> I mean, I, these systems aren't foolproof, right? And I think th there's sort of there's a certain level of um, trust and inability to detect real fraud and manipulation that sort of goes along with all of these things, right? I think like sort of at the end of the day, trusting your gut uh, is important, right? And and I think a lot of these things come out over time. I mean, we'll talk in a second about some examples of fraud, um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, all of these sorts of techniques, if you're an intelligent person, you can find a way around a lot, many of them, right? Like there are a bunch of data analysis tools to detect fraud or to, to sort of figure out whether your data is realistic. And, you know, it's, it's like security, right? And privacy, right? Like there's sort of an escalating war where at some level, it's certainly, I think it's certainly possible to dupe almost any of these things. The question is just how much effort are you putting in? How difficult is it to make it? And how much are we going to rely on the good intent of people who want to contribute good research? You know, there, there is evidence of fraud, right? People do game the system, but not much. It doesn't seem like, right? Like people, people do, you know, there is a huge cost if you get caught. It is harder. It's getting harder and harder to do that kind of thing. And I think, you know, so there, there's sort of this question of the social system and how well we, we are capable of rooting that out. And um, so, yeah. And I mean, honestly, if it's an interesting enough effect that you pre-register um, that and an effect size that's so surprising, right? Other people are gonna replicate it. And, you know, ideally there's sort of system level checks. No one researcher is really writing a narrative for the entire field, but it's a great, it's a great point. You know, and if you, I think that there's plenty of open space to actually work to address this kind of thing. You know, like if you can think of new systems to help um, prevent this kind of thing, new ways to collect data that are verified or, you know, this kind of thing where you really can't do your study a priori, then register it and then sort of like input it after the fact and act like you, you're acting honestly, you know, um, but hopefully we're not there yet in terms of trust, you know. Um, yeah, so uh, so that sort of end, concludes this section of the talk where I think we basically covered methods, you know, and, and uh, I wanna, I hope, you know, you feel reasonably confident about all of these sorts of things that we've listed here. The next thing I wanna talk about just very briefly is some of these system problems like fraud, right? So the two other issues that I, that I just wanna briefly talk about um, 
uh, are fraud and hype. So uh, this is probably the most canonical example in social psychology of fraud. This man is Diedrich Staple. He's actually written a book now on it, and he's gained a lot, actually quite, seems like a very successful career over telling this, the story of his fraud. Um, but he had 58 retractions, and it came out that he was making up everything that he was doing. And this man has published a paper on basically everything of interest in social psychology that you can imagine. So like a couple of the papers I wrote down here in science, he had a paper that showed physical environments that are more disordered promote stereotyping and discrimination, right? Or carnivores, you might've heard of this one. Carnivores are more selfish than uh, vegetarians um, or ads affect how consumers think about themselves. You know, these sorts of findings, you, if you look through everything that, this, that he's written, you will find something on a topic of interest to you um, in social psychology. So um, fascinating example. And actually, if you look at uh, Retraction Watch at the top, uh, Retraction People, actually the worst uh, frauds are anesthesiologists. There are two anesthesiologists that have like, had to retract hundreds of papers. So, but in social science, this man is the, is the winner. Another famous example, which I think Matt is gonna cover more in his lecture uh, that's recent is Dan Ariely um, and it textbook, textbook fraud, right? Like this, the, the data in his study um, should follow a normal distribution. It's widely known that it should follow a normal distribution and the data was just like a flat box, right? So super obvious, there was no denying it. Um, and it's been a very popular scandal in the news. So fraud does happen and a good place to go to just double check what's going on um, is retractiondatabase.org. It has this nice interface where you can put in the DOI of the paper you're interested in or search for an author or whatever, and it, they catalog all the retractions that, are, that exist. So it's a really useful um, tool. And I would highly encourage you to use it because there's other research that's out there right now that has been suggesting that replicated paper, and this seems to be, you know, there are many people that have looked into this, that findings that aren't replicated or findings that are retracted tend to be cited an outrageously, <laughs> outrageously more than the replication attempts or the findings that the um, other research, right? Because these types of findings tend to be really blockbuster findings, right? So don't cite papers <laughs> that have been replicated, that, that fail replication or that are retracted. It's really important to, uh, to double check what you're citing and what you're reading. Um, and I think a lot of people are guilty of just uh, reading the title and the abstract and citing the paper. Please, you know, please don't do that when you're writing papers. It's important to really understand the background material. Uh, another one that I think we're all aware of, you're all aware of is hype, right? Um, we definitely live in an ecosystem that rewards eye-catching claims, you know, big narratives, you, and doesn't necessarily reward extremely rigorous, nuanced uh, methodology, right? Uh, you need to find something interesting in order to get a job a lot, in a lot of cases, right? Um, and so, I, you know, when it comes to the news, we kind of expect this. We expect people to oversell and to oversimplify and to... Um, you know, conflate, this is a really bad one and I, it bothers me a lot, conflate statistically significant with significant, right? Like as we talked about before, p-values and statistical significance means we can have some amount of confidence or not that this, the effect is real. Not that the effect is meaningful, not that there's a significant, you know, that, that it's significant to people, right? That's the effect size. Whether the effect matters is how big of an effect it is, not whether it exists or not. And people really, you know, conflate statistically significant to mean meaningful when it when it does not. Um, but I think for us as researchers, you would be surprised how much this kind of stuff actually appears in papers too, right? Like people will. Um, it's important to be vigilant when you're reading papers. And so I pulled out a couple of pretty famous plots that. Um, get thrown around the research to justify a couple of things. One of them is from the stereotype threat, um, the canonical stereotype threat people where we're conditioning, adjusting by prior SAT store. There have been, we'll talk about this in a lot more detail. There's a lot of nuance with all of these things, but there have been 
you know, dozens of papers back and forth about how misinterpreted this plot has been and how misinterpreted the stereotype threat literature has been. Um, and so this is kind of a canonical example that gets argued about whether you should be, you know, basically taking out the SAT score pr uh, prior to focus on the differences, right? This is another one that uh, is a very popular paper uh, that, that get, and a very popular graph that gets thrown around quite a bit. Uh, Dan Ariely called this, I think, his favorite plot in all of social science. And this is one for the default effect, right? So you may have heard of this idea that, you know, for organ donors, if you make the form say, you know, do you want to opt out, people will stay opted in at insane levels, right? And if you want to opt in, you know, no one will opt in because it's such a, and the story is, it's such a complex decision that people will just go with the default. You know, that it's, it's too complex and abstract, so they just trust the default. And this is the plot that gets shown to justify that. Well, it turns out that all of these countries, it's not um, opt out in these countries. In these countries, it's presumed consent, right? So these countries, you don't make a choice. In order to opt out, you have to mail something in. You know, you have to think about it and decide and mail something in. And when they actually do look at the statistics of opt-in versus opt-out, there's a little bit of a difference. You know, there, it makes a little bit of a difference, but it's, it is not this difference, right? Um, and no country, no policy has been adopted that is opt-in, opt-out when, when it comes to organ donation, right? But this, this plot is a super famous one that gets thrown around quite a bit and has a lot of controversy surrounding it. And that's right out of a paper, right? Um, here's another example. This is uh, from Michael Walker's book, Why We Sleep. Um, this is the real data. This is the data that he's citing in the book. This is the plot that he put in the book. You might notice that the five hour bar is missing because it doesn't fit with the narrative. Um, you know, there's some examples of just really egregious stuff when it comes to plots. So my heuristics on looking at plots and reading papers tend to be one, mind the axes. You'd be surprised, you know, it can be hard to look through the paper and figure out what the axes are that are getting plot. Two is check the error bars. People oscillate between doing standard error and a 95% confidence interval. And those are a, two, a scaling factor of two, right? So just, you know, I don't know, just make sure that you know what the error bars are in the paper. And obviously always beware of relative claims. This is a really common one where people will say things like, there's a 50% increase in order to make it sound, you know, really powerful, but in, in absolute terms, it's very, very small and not particularly meaningful. Um, cool. So the last thing that I want to talk about before we uh, are done and break is just a quick overview of a couple of failures of replication. Um, so like I said before, I... I can talk about this for hours. There are so many interesting failures of replication and nuances here. And I'm just going to do a very tough, you know, there should be nuance when we talk about these things, right? Like we already talked about with the hypothesis testing, you know, you can't think categorically. You, everything has a caveat. You should be thinking sort of probabilistically about all these things. But I just want to sort of point out a few of the things that I at least have come to sort of not believe in anymore. And we'll talk in more depth about the nuance uh, a little bit later. Um, so one of the first ones that I want to mention is subliminal, subliminal advertising and subliminal effects in general. Um, so this was the sort of original um, subliminal advertising uh, experiment that set off the whole idea, right? And this was done by a guy named James Vickery, and it was an absolute fraud. The guy made millions and millions of dollars as a marketing consultant by saying that by flashing this sign, hungry eat popcorn, you know, 20% of people uh, more went and got popcorn. And if you look at the literature even now, um, Scientific American reports, I think in the last, their last piece on subliminal advertising, that it's real. And uh, there was a, there's a, a study about Lipton iced tea you know, that has some of the problems we talked about before. Lipton iced tea, people, um, subliminal advertising works to make you drink Lipton iced tea, but only if it's a brand that's not a very popular brand 
and only if you prime people to be thirsty before you introduce the subliminal advertising. That should set off an, a million alarm bells in your mind, right? And that has been reported, like I said, in Scientific American as a real result. BBC did a TV series where they tried to replicate it with the help of the researcher that, that found it a few years ago with three times the number of people and obviously there was no effect, right? So be very cautious about subliminal, anything subliminal, you should be, you're, you know, cautious about. Uh, one of the, the huge ones, right, is this idea of social uh, priming and priming research in general. Um, so one example of this is that warm beverages make you warm towards people. Um, this one has failed to replicate. This is a really popular one to see. Um, another one is, like I mentioned before, the elderly one, where if you see elderly words that suggest being old or elderly, you walk slower. And there are thousands of papers that all fall into this category of suggesting some sort of concept, you, you know, that doesn't, that you're not consciously processing, but it sort of creates some sort of association in your mind that then leads to behavior change that is measurable. Most of that you should be extremely skeptical of, right? You should be very, very skeptical of. Uh, another one that is pretty famous and that I've become very skeptical of are uh, physiological drivers of uh, emotional state and, and feeling in general. So one of the famous examples here is the power posing research, Amy Cuddy. The first author on this paper has come out and said that she does not believe that this is a real effect, but Amy Cuddy still sort of argues that there's something real here. Um, so this is a really famous example in, in uh, the replication world. Um, and another one is the facial feedback hypothesis, the idea that smiling makes you happy. And the way that we test whether smiling makes you happy, right? We can't tell you to smile because if we tell you to smile, you believe, you know, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to smile. I want to be happy, right? We have this, this sort of second order effect, right? So we have to somehow isolate the idea that the facial muscles, what we care about is whether your facial muscles, when you smile, make you feel happy, that there's some physiological driver of your happiness. And it's not some other aspect of you deciding to smile, you thinking about smiling, et cetera, et cetera. So the way that this research gets done is they tell people they'll hold a pen in their mouth and activate the muscles that would be the smile muscles. Or they look at people with Botox, you know, and they say like, do, do your emotional states change when your muscles change, right? Similar to the sort of power posing stuff, right? And this has been one of the famous failures of replication as well. Um, so this is, this is an interesting sphere, the sort of physiological drivers of emotional state and mental state. This is, I think, a more plausible and there's more nuance here. And I feel less confident saying throw all of this away, but you should be very skeptical when you um, encounter research that suggests that driving someone's physiology without them consciously aware of it or without them consciously making decisions to do it themselves, right, will actually result in a change in mental state. Uh, another one that I think is fascinating is behavioral economics and nudging research. So this is a paper recently um, that looks at 126 random controlled, randomized controlled trials over 23 million individuals. This is looking at all of the major government behavioral nudge units interventions that have come out. And uh, the estimated take up effect was 8.7% by all of the researchers. The actual effect sizes that they measured on average is 1.4% for all of the nudge interventions from behavioral economics. And if you look at that with a relative number, like we cautioned ourselves earlier, right, the uh, academic estimate was a 33.5% change, increase in a certain behavior, right? So you can see we can go from a very big sounding number to a very small sounding number very quickly. And so nudging works, right? I mean, this is a huge, huge study. It works, 1.4%, right? But if you're going to try to apply these ideas, these nudge nudge ideas at a personal level, right? That's going to, you know, you're going to have to have a huge number of participants to detect this kind of effect size on an individual level, right? So this is something to be wa wary of, right? Like this is real, 
there's real impact. 1%, you know, sort of at the scale of the US, right, is meaningful. But, you know, if we're designing individual interventions, something to really take into consideration. And in general, a lot of these things sort of fall under the umbrella of what uh, Jesse Singal calls prime world. And I like this idea, you know, that really subtle little uh, interventions and changes in your environment have these crazy big effects on your behavior. And there's a ton of research that falls in, under this umbrella, much of which we just talked about. And a lot of this goes back to a guy named uh, Mitchell, uh, who wrote, he's famous because he did the marshmallow test in psychology, where you put the marshmallow in front of the little kids, right, and see if they eat the marshmallow or will wait to get a second marshmallow. Um, one of these canonical studies in, in psychology. And he actually wrote a book in 1968 called Personality and Assessment. And he claimed that behavior is too situationally dependent, too cross-situationally dependent to say anything about personality. People don't behave consistently enough across context for personality to be useful at all. And he basically sent personality psychology away for the next, until now. Personality psychologists are a rare breed and social psychology took over. This idea that the situation is the primary thing that we need to be concerned about. And the situationism as a movement really sort of took over um, from trait psychology. And after all of this time, right, it actually turns out that traits are more predictive typically than situations when it comes to human behavior. But still, personality psychology is still kind of like a second class citizen and is only just now coming back. So there's some really interesting um, uh, sort of history to the fact that we've arrived at this worldview that's so popular in the psychology right now. Um, another big one that I, I love to think about and talk about is positive psychology, right? So positive psychology, I think, is full of um, interesting results. Um, one of the most famous ones is from Barbara Fredrickson um, called the critical positivity ratio, which was hailed as this um, incredible empirical finding. And it was derived from the Lorenz equations, suggesting that for non the nonlinear dynamic system of emotion, if you have a precise ratio of 2.9013 positive feelings to negative feelings, you will flourish. And if you are less than that, you will languish. And this was taught for eight years as one of the great findings of positive psychology. It's total BS. And um, the story around how it was retracted and the sort of back and forth here is, is really pretty interesting. Um, an older master's student was being taught it and sort of decided to do some fact checking in it, you know, the author who did the math just stopped responding and it became a big deal, right? But, but Barbara Fredrickson is still a big deal in the positive psychology community. And she still promotes this idea of a critical ratio where, you know, if you have these positive feelings, you, you flourish and negative feelings, you languish. And I have a lot to say <laughs> about how we think about positive psychology. I love this sort of idea of make mindfulness that the sort of in vogue ways we think about meaning in people's lives are and the empirical data that supports those is uh, really lacking. And the last thing I'll mention is a lot of the really canonical studies in psychology, things like the Milgram experiments, uh, the bystander effects, uh, the Stanford prison experiments, um, the, the, the marshmallow test. Uh, a lot of these things have been called into question in various ways. So like this one, this was an outright fraud, the story of, of Kitty Genovese. So the bystander effect, the reason that you know, we coined that term, right, is that this woman was murdered and something, 37 people were around and no one did anything and she was murdered in this horrific way. That's not actually true. And the, and the, the editor of the New York Times at the time um, fabricated the story, basically. I mean, she was murdered, but it was not in the way that it was reported that there were all these people around and nobody did anything, right? Um, so, and then same thing, Milgram, the Milgram experiments, there's nothing wrong with the methodology. These things happen. Same thing with the Stanford prison experiments. These things happened, but the way we interpret them has been the subject of a lot of debate and scrutiny now. And um, a lot of this is being revised, right? So the, the popular conceptions around almost every major philosophical or psychological finding has been really contested in the last five or six years is pretty shocking and, and surprising. And so we'll talk a little bit about 
some of these things as well uh, later on. So I just want to end with um, where we started, which is the story of Daryl Bem. So Daryl Bem is a great guy, actually. He's been very open with his data. He's shared it. He believes in Psy. He believes that we have premonitions. And I mean, but he has been great for the field, great for the field. And he's, you know, like I said, very open about sharing his data. His paper that kicked all of this off still has not been retracted, right? And, and the paper, there have been multiple people that have done analysis after the fact of his data. This is a letter from 2020 trying to get the paper retracted. It's, you know, it's still not retracted. And if you look at a paper that he wrote in 2015, he actually did a meta-analysis using the latest Bayesian techniques to show that over 90 experiments, anticipation of random future events is real. So the story keeps going, right? And Daryl Bem, you know, um, continues to poke and prod at the latest empirical methods. And who knows? I mean, maybe our ability to have premonitions really is real, you know? Um, so I'm gonna end there. This is sort of a summary of takeaway points that I tried to make throughout the, uh, the lecture. I'll, I will be posting the lecture um, so that you all can go through it. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much, pretty much it. Um, so next class, we'll be hearing from Noah um, about metastatistical techniques. Um, we have free time now for the next half hour. I'm gonna stick around. I think these guys will stick around. And if you wanna chat, if you have questions, I mean, we just kind of wanted to leave a fair amount of time open. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this, this, yeah, so this is just the chance that, um, yeah, that's actually a fair critique. Uh, I was just, well, so if you, if the idea was that uh, you have the odds of a p-value from chance and the odds of a p-value, real effect leading to a p-value, that there's some overlap in the odds that they would co-occur. Right, that, that you would sort of like draw um, and that you should separate that out uh, when you're looking at the likelihood of a p-value from chance um, being overlapped by a real p-value, right? So like if, if, I think it's maybe easier to consider in this example, one out of 20 times we would expect one from random chance, but four out of five times we would expect a real one. So like, at, at some time when we would expect one from random chance, we're going to get a real one. And so when those two things would co-occur, co when those two things would co-occur, we have to subtract out the, the odds of getting a real one to get the, the number of times that we would get a fake one, but we're not getting a fake one when we're getting a real one. I don't know if that sort of makes sense. All right, so like one out of 20 times, we're getting the... Uh, one from random noise, but four out of five times, we're getting uh, an actual effect. So if we look just at the subset of the one out of 20 times that we draw a random one, you know, sometimes, we, many times, we will actually also be getting sort of like a real effect. Like four out of five times that we have the one out of 20 times, <laughs> we'll get the real effect, right? Because that's just sort of how it works out, right? So you have to sort of take that into account when you're doing the math that, that um, some amount of times you, you'll, uh, that 0.05 will sort of like be overtaken by the real effect. Yes, for that, for that quantity. <laughs>
That's a great question. Uh, I feel like I want to make some very philosophical point about, and I'd love to hear you guys weigh in on this as well. I, I, my instinct is to make some philosophical point about intuition and reason and, you know, how do we know anything is true ever? And you should just, you know, like everything is relied on the basis of intuition, I think, strongly. There, there's some philosophical point that I'd like to make. A more specific point might be weekly informed priors also typically work really well with all of this stuff, right? So you can run this, this type of analysis typically with, a, you know, on two values, a value that you think is a really low likelihood, sort of lower or a high likelihood lower bound and an upper bound and, you know, see, see for yourself, you know, sort of take your own uncertainty into account when it comes to these sorts of things. That would be, I think that's the right answer, right? Is like sort of like use a weekly informed prior and really sort of like bound it in order to get a sense. And then, you know, maybe it is really sensitive in that range. You know, typically these things I think aren't, but maybe it's really sensitive. And then you have to sort of weigh, you know, your intuition against how much work you're going to be doing and maybe do an exploratory analysis or read more or, you know, I mean, it is a bit of a chicken and the egg problem, right? Like you got to look at, maybe you look at previous research, maybe you, you know, go out and drink a bunch of, you know, to try to convince your friends to, <laughs> drinking, you know, I don't know, right? Like, Totally, totally. Oh yeah, sure. Sorry, sorry, uh, online folks. Right. So the question is, is it reasonable to rely on previous research findings to inform your own prior when they probably had a really flawed understanding in the first place? Yeah, I think, yeah, I th well, and so back to a lot of the heuristics that we've been trying to use uh, or trying to sort of like promote here is like how much, yes, if that paper is bad, you are, you would be continuing bad research. And that's exactly the cycle we want to try to break. Right. So the question is, can you evaluate that paper in any meaningful way to say whether that data is useful or not? And hopefully there are some heuristics here that you can bring to bear and you should trust or not that paper based off of, you know, some combination of your intuition, your own lived experience, which is, you know, your own lived experience and maybe your evolved intuitive social physics or something and like uh, what data you have. But I think yeah, it's absolutely possible if you if you sort of take um, data in the literature at wholesale that you will make a mistake. And all of this stuff, I mean, it, it's also a fair critique of sort of it's sort of a fundamental uh, point about frequentist versus Bayesian statistics, right? I mean, I think that like you, you know, you sort of live in a world, sort of Bayesian worldview, right? Is like we don't live in a world of certainty. Everything is probabilistic, and like there's sort of an inherent risk that you sort of inherently have to rely on some amount of intuition. And like the, the more weakly informed, you know, it turns out that if you use really weak priors for a lot of things, they will, it will converge and it'll converge pretty fast. And so you don't really have to make ideally very strong assumptions, but I think, you know, absolutely, you know, absolutely it's possible to propagate bad science if you rely too heavily on, um, you know, papers that are, uh, 
not, not empirically strong. And you should do everything you can not to do that. And I, I actually, you know, I, I also personally think, right, that like a lot of this stuff is start from scratch and rebuild in a lot of different areas uh, of social psychology and psychology. There are a lot of assumptions that go into a lot of the psych research that I think are really bad assumptions. And there's, there's a lot of uh, opportunity to really revisit fundamental assumptions about what types of things we're studying and how we're reasoning about them and, and like really build back from the ground up. And I think you sort of see the research community in this period of transition from frequentist to Bayesian assumptions, causal and counterfactual modeling techniques that you know just haven't really been used and um, with a real reckoning on like all the bad statistical techniques that we've had, right? So um, it's, a, it's a very interesting time to be involved in this field, not only because it's such an important field, but because um, it's really like start from the ground up, you know, you could be the person, right? That, that's sort of like charting the new territory, I think. Uh, I don't off the top of my head. Hmm. Right, right. Yeah, so the question is about Daryl Bem and why it hasn't been retracted and what is going on there. Yeah, so you're right. I think that, so the, the conversation generally is the author has the power to retract their paper. Otherwise, you have to show some evidence, right? And Daryl Bem has been very willing to share his data and other people have gone through the data and the evidence is suggestive, but it's not conclusive that you know, it, like with so many of these things, right? It, it, you can't necessarily, um, it's hard to know what was going on in his head, how much of it was a priori versus sort of like after the fact uh, data analysis techniques, right? And so um, like the, the response letter that I showed was actually to another researcher who had, had access to Daryl Bem's data, had gone through it, cited five or six concerning things that are pretty, you know, pretty damning if your prior is that this result isn't real. Um, but the, the editor sort of said there's not, you know, well, a lot of the response tends to be, this was standard practice at the time, and we can't retroactively sort of use the statistical rigor that we are now accepting to sort of retract articles because we would end up retracting, you know, like every article that we ever had, basically. Um, but, which I think is really bad sort of logic, but uh, that's true. And it's been a really sh slow shift. I mean, just getting replications into these journals, that was like a no-go until a few years ago, right? So like the, the culture is changing, but it's, it's, it's a very slow, slow change. So, but yeah, I mean, to your point, um, So he states sort of like in interviews that his, his interpretation is that humans are precognizant, right? And, and it's, it's the type of question you're asking, I think, is um, indicative of this sort of categorical versus probabilistic way of viewing the world, right? Like there's nothing wrong with the probabilistic uh, 
uh, assumption that 53% of people click on the one that magically has a pornographic image behind it, right? That doesn't prove to most people, that doesn't prove anything, right? Um, and so with other people repeating the, uh, these experiments, which they have and published, you know, similar attempts that don't show the same result, we get a more complete statistical picture. So in some sense, you're right. There's no reason to retract, you know, that particular paper, except that he had nine experiments, all of them hit with statistical significance. So there's pretty, you know, there seems to be pretty strong evidence, particularly in the context of other people that have tried to replicate the results, that he did some sort of selective filtering or combining of his studies. And there, and there is evidence of that kind of thing, right? Like weird ends in the paper and weird combinations of sub, sub experiments. But, but that was common practice at the time. And, you know, it's not necessarily evidence of malfeasance, et cetera, et cetera. So these things get very touchy and political and kind of weird, which is why it's really important to understand the sort of social context when you're reading these papers, right? And, and you're sort of on your own in, in a lot of ways to make sure that what you're reading is empirically valid research. Um, A great question. I mean, well, so I think that there are a lot of places where you see this. Uh, to me, the biggest areas that where I think there's real, there's like a real problem. And this has really infiltrated the sort of, it, that I think this has really infiltrated the public's debate, right? These, these ways of viewing the world, particularly this notion of sort of prime world, right? So you'll get a lot of social critics that are talking about how, you know, you, let's talk about like Facebook and how Facebook is destroying democracy, right? And like the design decisions that Facebook are making and how that's affecting individual choice or advertising, like e our economic models, you know, how are the decisions we're making around advertising manipulating people? Are they coercive? Is there something fundamentally wrong? You know, what about, you know, you sort of look at the history of, uh, right? We had like the history of the 20th century, right? We sort of, we, we had uh, democracy and then, and, and Marxism sort of battling this out, right? And, um, and then all of a sudden in Germany, you know, democracy fell into fascism and everyone freaks out and we invent public relations to basically propagandize to our own population because we're too, <laughs> we have lost the belief that society is stable because people can be manipulated in very specific ways. And you have a whole history in psychology of people looking at how we're manipulate, you know, how easy it is to manipulate people. The Milgram experiments, you know, um, the, the Stanford prison experiments, that whole era is real rife with this idea that people are so easily manipulated by their context that they have no agency and we really need to control them as a government, right? So like there are huge, there's a whole history of really huge ramifications there I think there's a huge history in psychoanalysis and how we treat and even think about like mental illness and well-being. There's a whole like multi-billion dollar industry around positive psychology that, in my opinion, is preaching <laughs> um, to people ways of finding meaning in their lives that are absolutely devoid of meaning and, and are like really misleading people. You know, so I, there's, you know, not to mention the number of people in HCI and design who are trying to build, you know, technology or trying to do research where they're, they're really putting effort to like make things that help people, you know, change their lives or uh, break habits or build habits or, you know, like people that are really trying, you know, but their instincts are deeply misinformed by years 
of of a very you know out of touch worldview that's been promoted by this kind of you know social social psychology basically. Um, so I think there's there's really big ramifications actually in the world over, and uh, a lot of this has not made it out into the mainstream yet. You know, and if you read any pop psychology book, you know once you've sort of been exposed to a lot of this stuff, it, it's in every single one of them. Every single one of them is m making some crazy claims. You know, even the really good ones that I really love. You know, there there will always be a chapter or or something where you're just like that's crazy, you know, how could, how, is that really true? And then you sort of like dig into the, the literature that it's based on and it's pretty dubious, right? So I think there's a lot at stake. Yeah. I think it's a great point. I mean, it really is. They're like intelligent people. There's a lot of politics that's associated with, you know, like if you're tearing down the findings of all the great people in the field, right? Like, are you going to go into that field? And like, what is the state of that field going to be if you don't and you let people that are willing to play the game kind of like rise to the top so it's a very very high stakes yeah yeah it's a great point yeah I'm not aware of any publishing house doing that kind of thing. I mean, I'm not sure if the incentives are there for publishing houses to, the question is about publishing houses uh, sort of self-policing when it comes to retractions and this stuff. I mean, yeah, I'm not aware of any publishing houses doing that, but there has been this slow move towards accepting replications, which you know are tend to be boring papers that they don't wanna publish. So accepting replications, there's been a move towards that. There's been a move towards the pre-register thing. So, so there, there is evidence that they are changing their culture, but I think there's a, my personal view is it seems like there's a lot of reticence to go back and really deeply, you know, go through the careers of the people that are the, the editors and, you know, whatever, like, and, and just sort of like undermine all that stuff. But there are a lot of tools that are available that kind of automate some of this stuff. And there are blogs where people are doing these sorts of analyses on the topics that are really popular. And so, yeah, I mean, I think there are people outside of that that are starting to combine meta statistics and automated processes to give people easy tools to use to do this kind of thing. But I, my instinct is that all of that work is going to happen sort of like outside of the actual publishers. Uh, there's also a big move in open publishing too. I mean, it's you know, that's not to be ignored, right? Like and and open open review and all these other sorts of things where you're seeing, you know, sort of counter movements in publishing. But um, 
Yeah. Cool. Well, I think we're basically out of time. So unless there, if there you have any other questions, please come chat. Um, otherwise, we'll see you on Thursday. And we'll be doing the assignment on Thursday. And we'll be hearing from Noah. So it should be should be fun. Thank you, guys.